generate our own power, and the water truck comes twice a day. And if it doesn't come for a few days, we have to evacuate it because of the humidity and no water, no one will survive. And that's why I sometimes say, I learned yesterday that a nice phrase that the Monakeo Observatory is observing in paradise, <laughs> which of course connects to, to Hawaii. And I understand it completely. I sometimes welcome guests to Paranormal by saying welcome to Mars. <laughs> and it is a scientific outpost that is really isolated. The difference with Mars, as you all know, is there is oxygen here and it really helps. <laughs> It's a line it's, that we have spectra. It's a, it's a tenth of a second exposure. Jupiter is a bright planet. Um, it was done during the commissioning. It's, you then pick in this box with all these spectra. You pick a wavelength you like, like the one of the methane line. We know there's methane in the atmosphere of Jupiter. And blue indicates there's methane. There's no methane at the poles. also no methane on the moon that you see on the right, the little red dot. You see the shadow on the, on the face of the moon. That is the moon Europa. Now, Muse was not built to take 0.1 second exposures of the nearby planets, but it can actually do it. And that means you could actually follow the structure of the atmosphere of Jupiter and do all the spectroscopy of the environments as a function of time. You can look at by galaxies with polar disks. This is a galaxy in our own Milky Way with a huge disk of gas called the pole, and the colors here indicate the velocity deduced from the spectrum. Here is a galaxy running through a cluster, intercluster medium, and much of the gas in this spiral galaxy is being blown off by the intercluster gas, and it leaves this wave trail of ionized gas. slip at the time, if you slip somewhere if you want to go to zero or do another one, here you take the point and shoot, you take spectra of every pixel and you work out afterwards how it all has to be done. And the picture on the right, I believe many of you may have seen this. What is it? It's the Eagle Nebula, right? The iconic Hubble picture. It's not. It's nine pointing Constructed what Hubble would have observed with its broadband filters, and that's what you get. And it's nearly a shot, and we do it from the ground. If you look at the ESO website uh, this week, a couple days ago, we had a press release about this, about the three dimensional structure even of these towers of, of dust and which stars are formed. <coughs> so it's really a nice, nice instrument. The second recent arrival is an instrument called Sphere, which is this is a 
continuity sentence and the ductive optics assistant imager. That means it's a camera which uh, has extra technology in it that tries to correct for the turbulence in our atmosphere and make the images sharp to correct for all the blurring. Um, this is the known IO of Jupiter, which is 0.8 arc seconds across and will easily resolve some of the sort of volcanoes on it. This is Ganymede, not a moon of Jupiter. This is not very easy to see. You see here an arc which is dark. That's the shadow of Jupiter. And again, one and a half arc seconds across, <coughs> you see such. So it's a triple asteroid that was discovered. It was known to be double, and then there is a third one. Three rocks in the solar system circling each other. This is a massive daytime star with a lot of mass loss, which is clearly quite asymmetric. a little bit about the interferometer. Forward. Um, I already mentioned that if you use the telescopes together, you can get a fantastic angular resolution and with a baseline of 130 meters maximum. <coughs> the angular resolution is 2 million seconds in the near infrared. And not even the EOT can do that. It's four times as important, but of course not the same. It started out as a very difficult experimental uh, setup. It's now common user. Science is of course focused on uh, very, very sharp imaging of disks that form stars, far away and therefore very small. <coughs> it's also sharp enough that you can finally accurately measure that the stars are not actually <coughs> points as we see them with our eyes, that they're of course extended objects and they're actually not all spherical, as we even saw in the picture. And some stars are quite stressed. about it. Um, instead of giving every astronomer an hour with a big camera, we actually went for the other model. It's a group. You can compete for a lot of time and do a big survey, which you do for your own science, but you also make the data available in the archive for everyone else because there's much more in it that any team can do by themselves. And that's progressing quite well. telescopes once, but you can give them a new lease of life every five or ten years by taking advantage of developments in technology, that's the pattern in this all, and building a better instrument. I suppose most of you have a mobile phone, and I suppose most of you don't have a mobile phone you had five years ago, because there are better ones now. It's the same with these instruments. Big structures, the telescopes, it's very hard to keep them bigger, to build new ones. So we keep upgrading the, uh, the instruments and building new ones. That's all planned for the, the longer term future. We do things in house, um, and we also have to sometimes upgrade not only the telescope, but the whole infrastructure. There are some technical terms here for the astronomers. that I give them here. 
um, we built them not all in the basement where Vito had worked. This was the model in the 70s when we built a telescope, we had a couple instruments, and the observatory was built. When the VLT was conceived and then built, it became clear that there were so many opportunities now to build better and bigger instruments that it was simply not possible to do that uh, from the ESO budget or with the staff that ESO had. <coughs> substantially oversubscribed, especially for certain uh, popular models. Um, and there is a big committee that ranks all the proposals every six months and says these are the most exciting ones on paper at least. They should be studied. And only afterwards do we look to just check what the, from which country they come, but there's nothing we do with that. So it's a big competition. In some cases, when you get time, facility has contributed to almost any aspect of astronomy. It does not observe the sun for reasons that I think should be very obvious, but uh, I've already mentioned the planets in the solar system, that people also use it to study the most distant galaxies, the red blobs at the edge of the universe, and anything in between. The centerpiece here partnerships on the side of Chestnut Tour, which starts out with me for my claim, which holds Alma, <coughs> which will come in a second, and the Atacama Pathfinder experiment. This is a 12 meter submillimeter radio antenna. The partnership bond is Ramsalar and Sweden, and 
that it's like a bright field imager for all numbers with a lot of instruments. So, and for those of you in astronomy who know about the EAO here in Eastern Asia, the East Asian Observatory, the science course is rather similar to what you do with the JCMT. Same site. This is Chasan Tour. So Chico here and Deacon Kabur will take it in the back. Here's APEC actually. Here's the technical building for Alma, the high site, and here's the array. The East Asian Japanese Greek array, contact array here in the middle. Um, I'm sure this is not the first time you've heard about Alma.
presumably also plumbers. The best previous picture was taken in California uh, a few years earlier. It showed a block, no structure. And after the Alma observation, the angular resolution proved by a factor of more than 20, I think, which is a little above here is the angular resolution. This, this is the one in this picture. And it shows uh, troughs, it seems, or dark ridges in this disk that may well be the, uh, the tracks say a few words about the EOP and then conclude with a few words about the ESO as an organization. So, after La Silla, in the big jump forward, built the Paranal Observatory, which is pretty widely recognized as the, the premier observatory in the world, simple system. ESO tiptoed into the, and also entered the radio regime, the <coughs> short wave one, now time to take the next step, the developments in technology, take them and try to build an even larger optical telescope. That's the ELT, the European Extremely Large Telescope. Again, the names are not particularly exciting. The telescope built, it will have a 39.3 meter primary mirror, as you said in your introduction, thank you. And that is a transformational step. And Alma provided a transformational step in the radio regime because of the jump in resolution, the jump in sensitivity, etc., etc. The same will be true for the EOP. If you go from 8 or 10 meters to 39, you get a much bigger mirror, much more sensitive. And the jump is actually larger than the step between the naked eye and Galileo's telescope. may well be things that we have no clue about that we will discuss. The science is focused on exoplanets, on the very deep universe, on the very faint objects, and also on all the nearby galaxies, how to observe those, to resolve them into individual stars. Just as you can see stars in our own Milky Way, the other Milky Ways consist of lots and lots of stars, the other galaxies, but you need a sharp eye to not see just a fuzzy blob, but see all the individual stars. It's not cheap. It's also not expensive by the, if you calibrate it by particle accelerator, but correspondingly it's a pretty substantial investment. The total investment in Paranal is probably three quarters of a billion, maybe closer to a billion now, so it's not that far off. Um, Instruments, etc., etc., and the funding comes from the regular ESO income, extra contributions from the working <coughs> member states, who, despite the financial crisis, decided that this was such an interesting and exciting scientific project that they wanted to put extra money in it, which is good. It doesn't go to the banks, but it goes to science. And the accession of two new countries was in Poland. There is a full design, which is on our website. If you want to learn more about it, you can read all the details there. Uh, five mirrors instead of three to get the light to the instruments, to have more adaptive optics in the telescope than in the instruments. Um, the dome will be about 80 meters in diameter, 60 meters high. So that's actually larger than stadium, I think, which is close by, here. Um, but it has the additional feature that the roof can also rotate. Huh? It's not just opening, but it has to rotate. So this will be a bit of a pig to build, but it will be quite exciting. Uh, it will take about 10 years. And as I said, the science is focused on <coughs> characterizing the light of exoplanets, <coughs> biomarkers. This there is something. That is the structure of the atmosphere of the exoplanets. Is there a possibility that they apply more to the atmosphere? So 
be quite funny or ironic if this was discovered by, for example, this telescope, which is placed in one of the most lifeless areas of our entire planet. And that's where we go to, dis to discover life and evil. <coughs> Here's another picture of the area. We are sitting, you're sitting in the commercial flight from Antofagasta back to Santiago. You look at east again. Here's the volcano. You look very closely. Here's Paranal with the Vista Survey Telescope. Here's the base camp below it. And then across the valley here, 22 kilometers, is a mountain called Amazonas, 3,000 meters high, where we will place the telescope. And there used to be a rather poor road. was taken a few days ago from Paranal. We have a webcam on Paranal looking always at this mountain. Every hour it takes a picture, so in the end we have a movie where you can see how the, the mountain comes up. And you see there is now a platform. statement was rewritten 10 years ago to modernize it and the statement is to develop and operate world-class observing facilities for astronomy. And the world class means beyond the capabilities of the individual countries that make up ESO. If it's small or medium-sized countries can do it themselves. But at the level that I've shown you, which is needed for the science answer the science questions which I've touched on, they need to work together. Even the 14 was stretched on or the 16 to build the EOP. And the other part is to organize collaboration. We have a <coughs> staff of about 700. 12 percent has a PhD in astronomy or physics. The others are technicians, engineers, people in administrative functions. Um, 300 of the staff are in Chile because they run the observatories. And we have in-house science activities, fellowship programs, like one of the two that will be coming, our NISO fellow very soon. We have students, um, workshops, all of this, but we also um, have a lot of in-house engineering and so forth. And it's important to realize ESO is not a funding agency, it's an organization builds and operates telescopes. And it's matched by additional effort in the member states. Telescopes that build the industry, we have to pay them unfortunately, but okay. And 